please, is anyone in charge? It's a question we often ask about our world. Is anyone in charge? Well, is anyone in charge? Welcome to episode four in our series in the book of Revelation. I'm delighted that you've joined us. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jeff Gertson, we're St. Stephen's Church, and 2021 is the year of gentleness. Well, it's wonderful that we're going to be able to meet together again from this Sunday. We'll be meeting at our normal times of 8.30, 10 o'clock and 6.30 p.m. in the evening. The infection rates have declined significantly and vaccinations have started and so it seems an appropriate time for us to start to meet in person again. If you are concerned that uh, the services might be full because we're limited to 50 people as per government regulations, don't worry about that. As soon as they're full, we'll put on extra times to accommodate everybody. There are a couple of women's events coming up, so here are the details. Won't you take note of them if they apply to you? And then happy birthday and happy anniversary to the following people in this week ahead. That's all for now. Stay safe. God bless. See you soon. Let's pray. Father, you are holy. You are the Lord Almighty, who existed from time eternal, who is always present and who always will be. That truth astonishes us in our smallness. You are worthy of the worship of our hearts for your word created and your will determined our existence. Your throne signifies your rule for all eternity. Your son began the human story and he is worthy to complete it. He was slain to ransom people from every tribe and nation and language. We declare that you are worthy and we wait for you to fulfill all things, even as we look to your sovereign rule in the midst of our pain and our dysfunction. And so be honored, we pray, for you are worthy alone. Amen. Undoubtedly, one of my favorite characters in all of African history is Jean Badel Bokassa. His Imperial Majesty Bokassa I, Apostle of Peace and Servant of Jesus Christ, Emperor and Marshal of Central Africa. The date is the 4th of December 1977. 2,500 guests from 43 nations are in attendance for Emperor Bokassa's coronation over the Central African Empire. Inspired by Napoleon's coronation in 1804, Bokassa staged an elaborate ritual that cost $20 million in the Central African Republic, which he had renamed, renamed the Central African Empire. At the time, the country's entire gross domestic product was only about $250 million. He donned a 15 kilogram ermine and velvet coronation robe with a 13 meter train. The robe contained 785,000 pearls and a million beads. At the height of the ceremony, he crowned himself with a crown that included a 138 carat diamond. That crown was manufactured in Paris and cost over $2 million itself. He chose as his empress, Catherine, the youngest of his three wives, who was then also invested with a smaller crown. For the coronation banquet, 240 tons of food were flown in, mostly from France, including cases of champagne. 
The appetizer was a tureen of caviar so large that it required two chefs to carry it. The dessert, a green seven-tiered cake complete with half a dozen doves that flew out of it at the appropriate time. As the coronation unfolded, Bokassa ascended a giant throne shaped like an eagle with outstretched wings. And because this is a true story, here is a picture of that very throne. The imperial throne was made of two tons of gilded bronze, costing about two and a half million dollars itself. It was built in France where around 300 people were employed to work on it before it was shipped to the Central African Empire for the coronation ceremony. Bokassa was a vicious ruler who murdered his political opponents. He personally beat children who protested against his rule with a stick so that in one uprising a hundred children died and staggeringly he was even accused of cannibalism. He, he famously boasted that he had served human flesh at political functions to his enemies. Thankfully he was removed in a French funded political coup three years after his self coronation. The Central African Empire was short lived which is why you have probably never heard of Jean Bedel Bokassa. Now I begin today with that tragic piece of history because instinctively we know what thrones are about. For the most part, thrones live in museums and cathedrals and they're symbols of a strange and distant past. Thrones come from a time when, when knights rode on horses and, and kings ruled vast empires across the world. But despite that, we know what thrones are about. We know that they're about kingship and rule and power. In our world, there are, there are no real kings. Those with the title Your Majesty are pampered symbolic figureheads with, with little real power who's, who populate the pages of gossip magazines. Many rulers like Jean Bedel Bokassa desire the absolute unaccountability of kingship. They try and seize it even while masquerading often under the cloak of democracy. But few succeed. And soon they are gone, disappearing into the pages of history as tragic, sad and almost always delusional figures who self-indulgently wasted an opportunity to serve their people and advance their countries. Despite not having real kings, however, we know what thrones are about. We know what they signify. And today the Bible paints a picture of a throne. And it paints this picture in vivid color, in vivid detail, in order to communicate a vital truth that God wants us to know and he wants us to remember. Well, this summer term, we're in the book of Revelation. It's a much maligned, little understood, often badly used book. But it's also a book that is deeply encouraging. And as the book opened, we were introduced to the risen Jesus. No longer is he the dusty Palestinian carpenter on the road. No, now he is the risen, reigning, ruling king, walking amongst his church. He speaks tenderly to her. He calls her to listen. And he motivates her to endure. He's warning her that she's drifting and she's in danger. And tenderly, gently, he's speaking to her in the midst of her troubles and her pain. She, she's living in a world that hates her. She's living with temptations that, that clutch at her heart. She's in great danger. And so Jesus speaks so that we can overcome, so that we can stand firm to the end, so that we can be blessed. And in order to do this, he shows us the throne. It's not the throne of Jean Bedel Bocassa. It's the throne of the universe. Come with me. Come with me to Revelation chapter 4. And let me read for us from verse 1. After this I looked and behold I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I'd heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was 
in the spirit and behold a, a throne stood in heaven with, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Cornelian. And round the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Round the throne were, were 24 thrones and, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white. They were there in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. Now as I read that, did you notice that the word throne is mentioned a great deal? In Revelation 4 and 5, the word throne occurs 17 times. The author, that's God, wants the world to know that there is a throne in the center of the universe. That's to say God wants you to remember that someone is in control of everything. When you grapple with the seeming injustice of unequal suffering in the world, your heart will say to you, there's no one there. When you're burdened by the stench of, of corrupt rulers, you'll be tempted to think, no one's in control of this mess. When the despair of your own life descends upon your heart, you'll be tempted to think, it just isn't anyone who can do anything about it all. And all the while, atheist voices will shout loudly about the marvels of random evolutionary design. Into that cacophony of noise, God whispers to your heart, there is a throne. It's a throne of the most amazing beauty. There's a rainbow around it. And it rumbles with thunder and flashes with lightning. Before the throne are, are torches of fire. And in front and behind the throne there's what, what looks like a sea of glass clear as crystal. Now we could spend a lot of time discussing what each of those little details means. And, and that's a place of endless speculation. Pick up any commentary and commentator and they all have opinions about the meanings of all the symbols in this book. But here's a vital lesson to remember when we read Revelation. Learn it right at the beginning. It will it'll solve you a lot of heartache. It will help you a great deal with this book. Here's the lesson. Don't get stuck in the details. Now, let me say it again just in case you missed it or fell asleep. Don't get stuck in the details. The details are there to paint a picture to communicate a message, the details in and of themselves are not terribly important. And you'll flounder if you pause too long at the details. So don't. Rather than dive into the meaning of every stone and horseman and lightning bolt, rather step back and see the picture. Grasp the point. Today the point is simple. There is a throne and it is a great one. And then, as you're thinking about this throne, notice that the throne is not empty. Revelation 4 verse 2 again. A throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And round the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Round the thrones were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden thrones on their heads. There's someone on this great throne who has the appearance of light reflected in precious stones. The throne is occupied by someone Dressed in light. Don't look too closely. You, you might get blinded. And then notice that around this throne are, are other thrones. Verse 4. 24 of them in fact. And, and, and these other thrones are also occupied by other kings. We, we know they're kings because they're dressed in white. 
and they too have crowns on their heads. And, and these kings take their crowns and lay them before the central king. And they say, verse 11, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Reason? For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Who are these kings? Well, remember, don't get stuck in the details. What matters is that these kings submit themselves to the one king on the great throne. The message is simple. On that central throne is the king of kings. The one who is the creator king of all the universe. The, the universe didn't happen by some cosmic fortune stance of time and happenstance. It was made by a great king, these kings sing, who continue to rule it, which has just the most profound implications for us. Here's the first. Someone is in charge. When all around you is pain, hurting, sore, draining pain and grief, know this, someone has got it and they've got you. When, when all around you are people living wicked, horrendous lives and you get angry because they seem to be getting away with it, know this, someone sees and is in charge and he's got it. He has a, a second implication. Remember that the universe is not a democracy. God is very great and he's at the center of the universe. Not you, nor me, nor anyone. As we stare at the occupied throne, verse 6, we see on each side of the throne are, are, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Verse 7, the first living creature looks like a lion. The, the second living creature is like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Creatures covered in eyes, one of them like a lion, the mightiest of the wild animals, another like an ox, the, the mightiest of the domestic animals, the third like an eagle, the, the mightiest of the birds, and the, and the fourth is like a human, like a man, the, the pinnacle of all creation. Around the throne stand representatives of all the created world and they bow down and they say to the one that occupies the throne, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The universe, you see, is not a democracy. It's ruled by a God who is holy, holy, holy. But I'm not holy. If you don't believe me, you just have to ask my family. They'll tell you. They'll tell you that I'm selfish and sometimes angry and not always truthful. And worse, my heart actually loves evil. You see, I want to be on that throne and, and so do you. We live as if we're on it and, and everything we are fed tells us to keep on doing just that very thing. Jeff, it's all about you. You must be happy and you must get what you want and you must be fulfilled. And, and, and when you spend your money, spend it on you. And even when we think about heaven, we're asking, what's in it for me? But around the throne of heaven, everyone bows to God. All of creation bows down to the holy God because he made it and it exists for him. So remember this. Remember that there is an occupied throne with a holy God upon it. Remember that when you feel that your life just doesn't matter. Remember that when you're struggling with the meaning of life and the meaning of it all. Remember that. When you start to wonder about whether anything matters at all. Remember the throne when you're under the weight of the pain of this world and it all seems too much. 
Remember the occupied throne when it all seems out of control all around about you. Remember that when you are persecuted and shunned and mocked for your gentleness and your kindness, that there is a king on the throne. Remember that when you're tempted to give up on being a Christian because it's just so hard. And then remember that there is a throne when life is going really well as well and your profits are up and you've paid off your house and you've just got the dream family. Remember that there is a throne occupied by a holy God. Now, as we're watching the throne, a little exchange takes place. Chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? to open the scroll and break its seal. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And so I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and look into it. And, and, and one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, see, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he is conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The one dressed in light in the center of the throne has got a scroll in his hand and it's, it's covered with writing and the scroll is sealed with seven seals, which is just to say that it's really sealed. The scroll is, is God's plan of history for the universe. It, it's everything that we know. Who can fix the mess? Who can bring about the closing of the human story? Will, will Mother Teresa step forward at this moment? Or, or, or St. Augustine? Will, will, will Nelson Mandela step forward? Or Joe Biden? Uh, will the Dalai Lama step forward? Uh, or the Pope? Uh, what about Moses or, or Abraham? Will they step forward? Or, or David or Elijah or Solomon? Will they step forward? God calls for someone to tie up the ends of history, but there's no one who is worthy to open the scroll or even look inside. And so John, the author of Revelation, weeps because it seems like no one is going to be able to fix the mess, the mess of our world. But then we're shown the lion of the tribe of Judah. There's Old Testament history in that title, and so we look with eager expectation for the one who will do it. Lions are, well, they're powerful. Lions are used as the symbol of kings and, and, and mighty ones. The British lions, Richard the Lionheart, the Golden Lions, we're waiting breathlessly for the lion. And, and as we turn to look, we get the shock of our lives. Revelation 5 verse 6, I saw a lamb. Standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. We're looking. We're looking for a lion. And instead, we see a lamb. And not just a lamb, but a slaughtered lamb, a slain lamb, a, a killed lamb. <laughs> You'll know there's, there's no rugby team in all the world called the Lambs. The Western Province Lambs. Or, or perhaps, perhaps worse, the, the Western Province Dead Lambs. That's who John sees. He sees a dead lamb. In one brilliant stroke, we're confronted with the central theme of all the Bible. The lion is the lamb. The victory is through suffering. The death brings life. Greatness is service. Power is sacrifice. And rule is submission. And God, well, God suffers and dies. The slain lamb comes and, and takes the scroll from God in order to open the seals. And at that moment... 
The 24 elders all fall down before the Lamb and in, and in the next breath the angels of heaven, thousands upon thousands and, and, and 10,000 times 10,000 angels sing. And every creature under heaven and earth sings and, and we sing too. We sing worthy as the Lamb who was slain. By His death we've been ransomed. His blood has created a people from every tribe and nation. To, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Well, here's the final truth for us to grasp today. The one on the throne of heaven, the one in charge of history, is the one who sacrificially died in your place for you. The king of the universe is not some self-centered, narcissistic despot on the throne. This is not a Robert Mugabe, nor a Vladimir Putin, nor a, or a John Bedell Bokassa who, who whines and dines himself when his people starve. This is not an oppressive, dominating, self-serving king. No, the one on the throne is the lion lamb who gives himself in a death sacrifice for his very own people. When you and I leave this life, it's this lion lamb that we'll encounter. It's not Buddha, it's not Brahma, nor Shiva, nor Allah, nor anything. It is this God, this throne, this lion lamb that we'll meet. Can you see yourself there? Can you see yourself there sometime soon? Imagine standing there. And finding that you've lived your life shaking your fist in his face. Imagine standing there realizing that you've spent your life worshipping yourself. Imagine being the only one standing while everyone else bows in worship. Well then imagine being there and this lion lamb calls out your name. In front of all existence. And as he does that for all eternity to hear, he says these words to you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Because you stood firm for Christ. Because you stayed a Christian, though you were persecuted. Because you stayed in your marriage and you served your family when it cost you tears. You stayed loving Jesus when everyone else abandoned him. You continued to seek holiness when everyone else mocked you and, and they called you a prude and old-fashioned. You chose gentleness instinctively and consciously, not anger, and you lived kindly. And you did all that because you bowed yourself to the king on the throne and his blood atoned, his blood covered for you. Friends, he has a sure way to live. Live knowing that there is a throne Occupied by a holy God who rules. Live knowing that history is in the hand of the lion lamb who gave himself in death for us. Come, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we can know there is a throne and that it is occupied. And we thank you so much that the king on that throne is a suffering servant who would die in our place. What an astonishing thing that does to us as we remember that. We pray that you would let that truth permeate our hearts, that we might live lives of true worship as we seek to know this King and be there that day because his death was enough to cover for us. Thank you for encouraging us. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Jeff Gertzen. I'm the senior pastor at St. Stephen's Church, and I'd love to get to know you. Why don't you subscribe? Click our subscribe button. If you'd like to get to know a little bit more about Jesus, why don't you click on this video on this side? Or if you'd like to get to know a little bit more about our church, then click on this video over here. Thanks for watching. I look forward to hearing from you.